We've seen the huge impact COVID-19 has had on our political and economic system. But what is COVID-19 exactly? What does it do to our bodies and in particular to our lungs? A virus cannot be exactly called as a living being or it can't be called as a dead being. It is something like a twilight stage. It is on the edge. It has the genetic material, but it does not have the machinery to work on that genetic material. So it needs a host. By host, I mean it needs another organism to work. The virus progresses to the lungs of the patients and then it causes uh, pneumonia. The cells that we have in lungs cannot multiply. If I, they are destroyed, uh, they are replaced with a scar and it will lower the respiratory area that we have in lungs. It causes low amount of oxygen in the blood and leads to many complications. In the worst case scenario, um, the inflammation of the lungs is so high that we see fluids building up in the lungs and around the lungs, um, which cause um, something that is called an acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, um, which then again can also result in a shock of the patients. Most important organs are the brain and the heart. Uh, when there is not enough oxygen, our organism protects only those two organs. These patients have even a red skin because there is so uh, low amount of oxygen in the blood that their skin is starting to die. However, most of these people do not die because of the lung infection. They die because of hypoxia. It can survive on surfaces as well. So we are not just looking at contracting the disease from the droplet nuclei. The patient has touched the handle of the door and if I touch the handle of the door and I end up touching my mouth, that's how the disease will get contracted to me as well. Based on the current data, uh, most of the patients are asymptomatic. It means that his immune system is doing well with fighting with this virus. However, th this virus is still in his respiratory system outside of these human cells and he's spreading this disease as much as a person who has symptoms. Even after recovery, he has a potential to transmit the infection to many. And the recovery period is can extend from anything from 14 days to a month. There have been other epidemics that have marked the history of humanity. The plague in the 14th century, the Spanish fever in the early 1900s, and most recently, SARS, MERS, and Ebola. So how is COVID-19 different from these epidemics? What made it possible for it to spread so rapidly and widely to become a pandemic? This disease is not something that was uh not expected. I think we've been having flu-like viruses come many times with a lot of different variations. We also had swine flu for very recently, maybe like five or six years ago. And I don't think um, people took it seriously enough because it wasn't a pandemic. There's no knowledge. You know, all it is being, you know, experiences, mostly empirical, are being shared on various platforms. And nobody really knows till now, you know, what medicines are working. When the first case of Ebola was was seen in the US. US basically shut down all of the flights from the continent itself for a very long time. However, when we first found the case of coronavirus, the first case sort of came in December, January, and we had lockdown in March, April. We gave it the kind of time of two months to kind of spread. Governments of countries all around the world have set up specific procedures to detect infection amongst people. However, because swabs ran out quickly, medical authorities had to soon restrict the testing. People who had been exposed to a situation that facilitated the spread of the virus or those who already had symptoms became priority. I started feeling in bed uh, like four or five days before the, uh, the stay safe campaign uh, or uh, the stay at home campaign. Four, four days before that, I started uh, feeling uh, like with symptoms of this flu. It was, I hadn't had these symptoms since years ago. I, ha I had headache. Uh, also, I had cough. I have fever for two days. The first thing is the cough. 
uh, and this happened uh, on Friday. Uh, on on Saturday, I had fever. Uh, I can uh, down the fever more than 37 uh, and half degrees. Once I landed, uh, I even though I felt perfectly healthy, I had no symptoms. I passed airport checks, but uh, I still went straight into a separate apartment away from my family to self-isolate. And the plan was just to carry out the standard uh, recommended 14-day self-quarantine. As soon as I started feeling bad, I, I started uh, taking precautions with uh, here inside my my house with my family because I live with my parents and my brother, and I didn't want to to give them or uh, yeah to expand the, the virus with them. Well, I stood I stood at, I, I'm at my room and my parents uh, brought uh, food or something and they left in the in the door. After it, I had irritation in the throat. Uh, after. And, uh, and I was with this uh, around one week more. And after it, everything was okay. I feel tired, uh, of course, but uh, it's, it's how I passed the, the bills. But uh, on the 21st, which is four days after I landed, I fainted while walking around at home. Uh, unfortunately, I, I fell on my face and happened to break a few teeth and face up some other facial injuries. So uh, I think that's when I thought that, okay, maybe this is not just a regular fever. The sudden spread of COVID-19 has been a health emergency, and as such, it has made it necessary for the healthcare systems of countries all around the world to reorganize internally, to reconsider their priorities, and to address new issues caused by the spread of the virus specifically. How have hospitals reorganized structurally, and how have the tasks been redistributed within the medical staff. I think there's a lot of disruption and a lot of expectations, you know, to doctors' training, their progression, you know, their their rotations. That's been really disruptive. And so, you know, a lot of people's plans, you know, that might have been coming, you know, in fruition for many years, have had to be kind of cancelled or curtailed, and that that's really difficult. So in Germany, we kind of do have the system, but in doubt and right now we do have the luxury of having enough ICU beds. Um, we put them down there to get intubated earlier and like in a controlled setting rather than doing a lot of emergency intubations. There was um, a, a letter from uh, someone in New York that circulated where they were saying that they were really overwhelmed, short of, of a protective equipment, um, short of ventilator, ICU beds. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have been fortunate so far, but it's not not for everybody has been like that. Usually we work uh, divided in two different teams. One works until midday and second one up to, until uh, late afternoon. And there are some words that actually change the whole systems and the shifts. It's called also a night shift. For us, in the internal medicine department, obviously we are fairly busy. We only work with half of the doctors. A lot of disruption constantly changing as, you know, as patient. What well, one week we think that the, our whole ward was going to become a COVID ward. So all the patients moved, all the nurses would be kind of just have to change all their work. But then the net, like because the number of patients has not increased, a sort of plateaued and so yeah every, almost every day things are changing and i think the scene is a little bit like that that we do have briefings twice a day and that the situation can change from one briefing to another and there are many hospitals that uh, are not so well resourced and cannot employ as much doctors uh, as many doctors as we can so in the situation that doctors have to work for 72 hours straight of 48 hours straight to cover. And if a quarantine is introduced in the hospital, they must work for 14 days straight because no one else can enter this hospital and they cannot leave either. People who had been working in one specialty have been pulled into uh, a you know, emergency response. Um, so that's, that's very unsettling. They feel quite out of their depth. We need to protect ourselves. 
so that the contact with patients it's not so direct anymore and I think it's the biggest change we did uh, we have in our work we often have to wear protective suits masks goggles and many more equipment that basically isolates us from the virus but also from the patients for example in Romania the whole health system has been um let's not say blocked but slowed down because right now everything that's not uh, an emergency technically will not go into hospitals which is a problem because this way you might lose a cancer this way you might lose a pulmonary problem or maybe a, uh, an infection if you are not paying attention or not being careful we do have a lot of aid from other specializations as well so we have a big mix of team um, meaning that nurses and also doctors from other specialties are helping us and are also getting trained in internal medicine and emergency medicine procedures. That is a really good part is that uh, uh, lots of people like interns and residents and uh, seniors uh, who were uh, not busy because they didn't have any patients like every everything that they had to do was postponed due to the to the quarantine and we got a lot of help from this uh, these people. As the situation got increasingly serious Even people outside the medical field, especially those who had been infected with COVID-19, got a better understanding of what hospital stays are like and what doctors and nurses experience every day. What are patients' thoughts? What is their attitude towards this pandemic? And what are their sources of comfort in these somber times? It was a ward with multiple rooms and each room had two or three people. Uh There's distance between the beds and stuff, but the but the rooms have glass, like they're glass walls, so you can see through the rooms and you can see everyone else. You can see the, everyone in the ward. But I I preferred it that way because it's less lonely. I don't want to go to the to the hospital because I know that they are full. I I make a call. They ask me and they say, okay, surely you have virus. Stay at home. If you don't feel worse than you are now. Uh, don't come to the hospital and 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 do this and this and this generally new patients who come in tended to be stressed and worried and other patients would tend to be nice and comforting towards them when this happened somebody in the hospital uh phone call me each day to follow my progression at the end they call me they say okay you are feel you have nothing uh okay uh you have it and and i don't i don't put Uh, any food in any hospital uh, after that um, i didn't receive any call or because it, i understand that they were over uh, over working with other cases and, and harder harder cases than mine so i tried to, to not um, call more there were people who were completely asymptomatic uh, and had no symptoms whatsoever not even a headache and there were people who were quite serious there were people who lost their loved ones be alone with no body around you passing uh this strange uh, virus because you have it but you don't know you know how this virus affect you at the end it was very difficult i i needed some pills to sleep to be relaxed i i need help it was a lot of changes in a, in a very short time when the state of emergency was declared by governments and lockdown was announced at first several people outside the medical field complained that the measures were unnecessarily restrictive of individual freedom and that such alarmistic positions were not grounded they didn't realize that they were lucky instead for just being able to stay home while the medical community had to rush to hospitals to help since then the medical personnel have bravely stood in the front line every day facing the spread of covid-19 what are their thoughts on the current situation what is their mood and what are their fears concerns and struggles the main problem the crux of this pandemic is transmissibility and the transmissibility during the asymptomatic phase that is you don't know who the infected person is so every person should be treated as a suspect or a possible potential threat there has been a major issue with 
getting the reports and discharging patients because we need to realize that if a positive patient remains stuck in a ward just because the swab reports are not coming back this patient can get reinfected and the whole quarantine period will go on again so that that is just one of the few issues that we are encountering if the patient is uh, immunologically strong then it might resolve after these symptoms however the patient is immunologically suppressed or the patient is old having multiple comorbidities having respiratory condition then it will progress further to a pneumonia a viral pneumonia and it will cause respiratory suppression and ultimately result in respiratory arrest that is the reason why we are facing such shortage of ventilators at the moment yeah, all over the world there is no actual solution to not having enough ventilators um the only thing that can be done is easy detection and then making sure that they don't reach the state that they need a ventilator but one of the issues that i think is should be pointed out is the collection of swab and tracing of the report and also the concept of false positivity and false negativity how sensitive are these tests because we are not using swab swabs as a screening test we are using this as a diagnostic test as well so we had a case we had a patient who came in to the EMS and he came in with a uh, with shortness of breath and breathless he came in with breathlessness he was intubated uh, Uh, as soon as he came however we lost the patient and post mortem we did uh, we did conduct the covid uh, testing and the patient came out to be covid positive that was the first patient who came out to be covid positive and we diagnosed that after he died so it was uh, a night shift in intensive care units and uh, you know it was like every night in intensive care unit these days a really difficult night lots of people to to look after and lots of catastrophes generally speaking and uh, at uh, 6 pm at 6 am in the morning at the end of the night shift uh, one of the patients died you know 60 years old not not that young but really not that old when he died uh, i was told not to warn not uh, to warn to call the family but i was told not to tell them that they could come and um for me it was like really impossible to do because uh, i think it's very important when the when a relative die uh, that uh, the family can come in the hospital can see the doctor can talk to the doctor can gather uh, around the body if it is a wish and i was told not to i did anyway and it was really difficult because uh, the family we are not allowed to go in the room they did uh, with me uh, with me in the room so that uh, all the hygiene uh, everything was respected like it should be and the staying in the hostel over here and my people are in bombay so at this particular hour i'm thinking that i should have been at home taking care of my kid is but natural because of human being uh, but then uh, my daughter tells me ki mam i'm happy that you are there you're taking care of the patients and all that gives me a lot of courage and that is my strength which i am going up plus i got my two children abroad on a daily basis they ring me up that since i am over 60 they do get stressed but having been in the defense forces handle much more serious problems life endangering problems and it's my call of duty to come and do my best what is possible in the present circumstances definitely there's an element of stress you never know one is but then this is a call of duty that is much more than this stress landlords are evicting uh, medical staff uh, this see uh, uh, situation is faced by few of our ward boys like my colleagues like they stay in a place called dandupalya where landlords told them not to go for work if they are going to go for work they will be uh, i mean forced to evict from their house and it is difficult for them to find new houses or else they can't go back to their native source so they got stuck in between now so my management is kind so they brought them to our hospital they have given a space for them to stay till this pandemic situation is come i mean come down as a doctor i understand the gravity of the situation when the who says that it's a pandemic so i think the health professionals not just doctors even the other paramedics they sort of understand the gravity of the situation however we need to understand that it sh- it shouldn't be taken for granted that other people who are not in the profession will understand the gravity of the situation 
we have never had something like this in our lifetimes, especially young people. So it's difficult for us to comprehend the severity of the situation unless you actually witness it. If I go home and look through the window and parents with uh, children going outside and spending time uh, in the yards and not caring about anything, I'm very much angry because I know what is the situation in the hospital. When I go to the shop, I see people who do not do obligatory stuff. They just walk with a dog, a bit with friends, doing it. It's permitted in the country. However, people do not care about it. And I think in the starting of the lockdown or when, we, when it just started rising and the cases were happening, unless you saw it on your own, most people were just like, oh, this is something that could never happen to me. But as things got even worse, I think young people have sort of also taken it upon themselves to quarantine and, you know, make sure that they're not adding to the problem. The problem is that we are not so scared about our own death, but rather to get infected. Because when we are infected, we are easily spreading this disease. We won't be able to have any more contact with patients. If you purchase a, so 100,000 ICUs now, uh, and, uh, you know, create new ICUs, or invest all your money on you know all this infrastructure and it, it may not be useful you know after six months but building community processes is more important and you know traditionally there is a decline of uh, practice of family physicians family doctors in which you try to gain it back you know build it back through institutional processes you know we've also had many cases of patients who have recovered and then had like a a resurgence and then even worse. Yeah. I see them very scared and I don't blame them. All I can do is have empathy for them. We also have people clapping at uh, 8 p.m. every day. And uh, to be perfectly honest, when it started, uh, when it started, I was really, really pissed off uh, because uh, when we were on strike uh, a few weeks before, uh, nobody except the medical and the paramedical staff uh, was in the, in the manifestation. Uh, on the other hand, there's been a lot of goodwill and a lot of kind of focus and celebration of health workers. It's sort of exposed how uh, challenging and kind of uh, under pressure the health system was. And so, yeah, the kind of positive aspect of it is that it does not move me at all, to be perfectly honest, because I think that most of people really do that because they are bored. Uh, bored by, by the lockdown and the quarantine. But I might be a little cynical, but uh, <laughs> that's my opinion anyway. As the rate of infection started going down in Europe, the medical personnel could finally take a breath of relief and go back to working their ordinary shifts. However, in parts of the world such as the US, Brazil and India, the situation is still critical and lots of hospitals are still overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients. As the whole world prepares to face a second wave of cases that has already started to threaten countries such as Spain and France, people wait for a hopefully not too far away future when a vaccine has been found and we can all walk down the street without wearing masks and hug people with no fear of being infected.